Well, thank you, President Park, for your very kind introduction. Let me also thank President Lin of uh, Peking University for the invitation to join you today and for the privilege of offering this keynote address. Uh, it is a great honor. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, wonderful to be back in Beijing. Deeply grateful for the warm hospitality that I have received here over the years. Uh, indeed, Beijing truly embodies the spirit and optimism of this forum. So I hope my remarks this morning, now this afternoon, uh, continue uh, in that spirit. Uh, in particular, I want to speak to the forum's sub-theme, mutual trust, cooperation, and sharing. Let me begin with some context. Two powerful and conflicting forces are shaping the current geopolitical landscape. On the one hand, a movement to retreat from international engagement appears to be gaining momentum in some corners of the globe. The Brexit campaign in the UK is a perfect and somewhat dispiriting example. More than 15 million people, nearly 54% of all ballots cast, voted for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. The resulting turmoil in the UK and the EU has been well documented but despite this, political parties in Germany, France, the Netherlands, Italy, Austria, and likely others by now, have called for similar referendums on EU membership. Well, to foreshadow some of my thoughts uh, in my remarks today, it's worth noting that immediately after the Brexit vote, I began receiving letters from the leaders of major universities in the UK committing to expanding their collaborations with the University of Toronto and other global institutions. Meanwhile, in the United States, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has offered a vision of America's future that many regard as populist, America first, anti-immigration, and even anti-international. And despite debasing American politics, as The Economist so eloquently pointed out, nearly 14 million people voted for Donald Trump during the Republican primaries. We will wait to see the results of the election itself, of course, in a few short days. But it is clear that there is a major force in global politics moving us away from mutual trust, cooperation, and sharing at least on the international stage. Moreover, this trend to retreat from international engagement comes at a pivotal and difficult moment. A second powerful force is simultaneously shaping the geopolitical landscape. The international community is increasingly facing challenges that are global in nature and whose solutions require international cooperation. The challenges, climate change, international migration, health epidemics, poverty, and global inequality, to name a few noteworthy examples, cannot be met without working together. This slide shows the 14 pressing global challenges identified by the Millennium Project arising from the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. Countries working on these challenges in isolation may make incremental progress, but they are ultimately doomed to fail if they try to tackle them alone. So how can the tension between these two competing forces be resolved? Well, a close look at the map of how the UK voted in the Brexit referendum offers a promising insight. This is a map from the New York Times showing the leave and remain votes by region. Leave is in uh, the red color. Uh, remain is in blue. The deeper the color, the more uniform the vote. As many commentators have pointed out, the major urban regions are almost without exception intensely blue. I've circled some of the major ones here. You can see London, of course, Oxford and Cambridge, Edinburgh and Glasgow up uh, in Scotland, also Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds. Coventry, and so on. Well, what is less often pointed out 
when looking at a map like this is the striking observation that each of these locations is home to one or more well-regarded research-intensive universities. So this observation leads to the main point of my remarks today. A third powerful force is also reshaping the geopolitical landscape, global research collaboration. And this, I would suggest, provides one way to resolve the tension between the forces moving us away from international engagement and the international nature of the serious challenges that the world faces. Universities and research institutions based in major urban regions around the globe are collaborating in the discovery and transmission of new ideas and the innovations that come from them as never before in our history. These collaborations are still underappreciated, but they deserve both more recognition and more support as they help advance global prosperity. Let me spend the remainder of my time here on the podium reviewing some of the evidence for my confidence in the value of international research collaboration. There are two features of international collaboration that I think deserve special attention. The first, paradoxically, starts at home. At the University of Toronto, we are privileged to be located in one of the world's most diverse urban regions. Fully half of the Toronto region's population, 50%, was born outside of Canada. Striking, absolutely staggering diversity. This remarkable diversity is reflected on our university's campuses. More than two-thirds of our undergraduate students identify as so-called visible minorities. International students from 165 countries comprise one quarter of the incoming class. And our faculty and staff are similarly international, with half of all faculty appointments coming from outside Canada. Now, many world-class universities and regions around the world can boast of similar demographics. So why does this kind of international diversity, a kind of local international collaboration, matter? Well, outstanding scholarship, teaching, learning, and innovation can thrive only by examining a variety of ideas, discarding those that fail, and improving those that work. The new ideas, fresh perspectives, and novel approaches we encounter by inviting the world to our cities, campuses, and classrooms help create new knowledge and solutions by testing our assumptions, shifting frames of reference, and offering new insights. It's hard to quantify the value of welcoming international students and scholars to our institutions and cities. And it's also sometimes hard to convince policymakers to make the necessary investments when there are so many other investments that seem more obviously beneficial to domestic audiences. But internationalization at home is an important part of international collaboration. The second aspect of this phenomenon is, of course, global collaboration among universities, institutions, and urban regions. The data are readily available, and they are absolutely compelling. So let's start with research intensity. This slide shows the most research intensive urban regions in the world as measured by publication count from 2010 to 2015. Uh, and if you're wondering, uh, I should point out that I have used broad geographic definitions. So for example, uh, the numbers for London here also would include Oxford and Cambridge as part of the broad uh, metropolitan region uh, of Greater London. Strikingly, the world's top research-producing regions are also among the world's most dynamic metropolitan economies. And there are good reasons for this, from the qualities that attract talent and capital to the conditions that create and leverage opportunity. Now, full disclosure, for much of my academic career, uh, as you heard in the introduction, I've studied the economic geography of innovation and the role of urbanization and cluster dynamics in advancing a region's well-being. So I could talk about this subject all day, but rest assured I will not. 
what I want to focus on here uh, is a, another feature that these regions all share. They are fundamentally collaborative regions, and they host globally connected world-class universities. So this slide shows the world's leading urban regions by international collaboration, measured by the number of peer-reviewed publications that scholars in these regions have written with authors in other countries. The players are substantially the same, but with some notable changes in ranking. It's worth noting the changes in U.S. regions, for example. This chart shows only international collaborations. U.S. institutions and scholars have many domestic collaborators with, with, with which they work, but are less likely on, on balance uh, to engage in international collaboration. Overall, the, the numbers are really staggering. Since 2010, scholars at just the top 50 research-intensive universities in the world, just the top 50, have collaborated with international partners on peer-reviewed publications 1.2 million times, creating a vast knowledge network that crisscrosses the globe. I think it's worth emphasizing a couple of points here. First, global international collaborations have been growing rapidly in recent years. So this is the picture for the period from 2010 to 2015. Here's a similar kind of graph uh, for an earlier period. Same chart of the world's leading internationally uh, collaborating regions on the same scale, but from just 15 years earlier. Clearly, international collaboration uh, has been exploding in recent times. Second, it's not just the number of global collaborations that is impressive, it's also the scale and reach of global knowledge production that is important. This slide shows the Toronto and Beijing region's international collaborations between 2010 and 2015, collaborations that produced over 100 co-publications. As you can see, both Toronto and Beijing are significant contributors to this global network. But the collaboration network map of the top 20 leading international collaborators is really overwhelming. So going beyond just Toronto and Beijing, we now uh, add the top 20, the rest of the top 20. So Toronto and Beijing in blue and red are joined here by the other leading collaborating regions. And as before, each line on this map represents 100 or more, or more co-publications. So in an important sense, this is a map of the globe's arteries, carrying ideas and opportunities and fueling creativity and innovation. So why does all this international collaboration matter? Well, it matters because our collective prosperity depends not only on the knowledge and know-how and experience we produce at home, but also the knowledge originating in other leading centers of research and innovation around the world. Universities and urban regions more generally are gateways to these knowledge producing and learning opportunities. They are critically important nodes in an interconnected global knowledge network as one look at this map will demonstrate. I would argue that participating in this global network is increasingly important for local, national, and indeed global prosperity. These connected places are the urban regions that will collaborate on finding humanity's answers to climate change, international migration, health epidemics, and the other big global challenges of our time. This isn't simply well-informed speculation. Indeed, venture capital and other forms of mobile investment now seek out these special nodal places and the opportunities that are signaled by their world-leading research their deep talent pools, and their connections with other global centers of knowledge production and innovation. Now, I'd like to show you two last maps that make this abundantly clear. Here are those same top 20 urban regions by international co-publication. The size of the yellow circles is proportional to the scale of a region's international collaboration. And here, 
I have overlaid a heat map showing geographical variations in patent density around the world. There are some limitations with this map. The data come from the USPTO, and so they likely undercount patent activity in some parts of Asia. And also, we know that patenting activity is only one very limited measure of innovation. Nevertheless, the pattern is striking and unmistakable. Those same regions that lead the world in international collaboration also lead the world in patent density. This strongly suggests that the fresh and unexpected ideas, perspectives, and insights that we glean from collaborating with our international peers do indeed help spark discovery and innovation. Well, to conclude, I hope I've begun to show today how international research collaboration, based in the world's great cities, is fostering global prosperity by generating and transmitting new ideas and the innovations that come from them as never before in our history. Indeed, in a world in which geopolitical forces sometimes work to divide us, a renewed commitment to understanding, learning, knowledge, and innovation can unite us. Universities, research institutions, and major urban regions around the globe are leading by example, pushing back against the forces that impede our collective progress. In today's world, international research collaboration is an inspiring example of mutual trust, cooperation, and sharing. We should celebrate the universities and city regions at the forefront of this effort and lend them our support. Thank you for your kind attention.